This episode is brought to you by Cox Contour TV. Find the entertainment you love with Contour TV and Contour Stream Player. Learn more at coxcox.com slash contour. From Sugar 23, I'm Angela Ledgerwood, and this is Lit Up. I only listen to one podcast religiously, and it's Elizabeth Day's podcast, who is our guest today. Her pod is called How to Fail, a celebration of all the things that haven't gone right. Elizabeth is an absolute sensation in the UK, and she's an award-winning journalist and broadcaster, an author of five novels and a memoir that's inspired by her podcast which is all about looking at your life through the lens of failure and how they've propelled you forward. Today, I plan to talk to her about Magpie, her new psychological and domestic thriller that's centered around a couple trying to have a baby and the roommate that they take in to help pay the rent. It's full of twists and turns, which we don't want to give away, but the novel is about the lengths of which we go to to have children. Magpie is certainly a part of this conversation, but Elizabeth and I went off course a little bit and we started talking more and more about her journey to become the person she is today, and I certainly share some thoughts of my own. This is a very open and earnest conversation about the path to understanding and sticking up for yourself. I really hope you enjoy it. You know, how to fail is my go-to podcast that was just the balm, particularly over lockdown and those years that we all had that were so strange. And then to to read your book about the podcast, I would open it up when I just needed some help again and connection with brilliant women. And then to read your novel Magpie and have it obviously connect to parts of, you know, the conversations in How to Fail, but your own life story has been just such a gift. So to have you on Lit Up, that's a long-winded intro. Elizabeth Day, what a pleasure to have you. The honour is all mine. Thank you so much for saying those things. I cannot tell you how much it means to me. I mean, I write in order to be seen and to see others. So when I feel seen by someone who I haven't actually met... It's the most precious gift you could give me. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Well, I'm going to dive into maybe an unusual spot that right now isn't connected to your brilliant novel Magpie, which is this domestic thriller. But I want to read a sentence from How to Fail, your book. And then I want you to tell us a bit about the story in there. So... It's from the section, How to Fail at Work, and it's the opening line (laughs) that says, I once found myself in an isolated farmhouse on Bodmin Moor in Cornwall, being fed badger by a stranger. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I love that you picked that line. (laughs) It seems so random to have picked that, but I feel there was something about this part of the section of how to fail that connects to work and summoning one's instincts that I feel leads to so much of your work. So I wanted to start there with some badger. What was going on? (laughs) That is the best possible place to start. Whenever I write a book, I want to start it in an arresting way. And you've done exactly the same with this podcast. So what was going on was... At that time, I was a newspaper journalist for the Sunday Telegraph, and I had always wanted to be a print journalist and an author. And when I left university, I went straight into newspaper journalism, but I had to build up my portfolio by doing a lot of unpaid internships, a lot of sort of trial runs. And eventually I'd ended up with a with a job on this Sunday newspaper And I was there as a news reporter, but I really, really wanted to write features. So whenever someone would offer me the opportunity to flex my writerly muscle, I would say yes. No matter what it was, I would just say yes, because I wanted someone to acknowledge that I could do it. And one of these instances was I was asked to go and interview someone who described himself as a roadkill chef. 
that is someone who literally would scoop up a dead badger or a dead pheasant from the road that another driver had run over, take that creature back to his isolated farmhouse on Bodmin Moor in Cornwall, <laughs> strip that creature of feathers or fur, and then just boil it up in some kind of casserole. And he was publishing a cookbook. And so I, I would have been in my early 20s. I was sent to interview him and, and unthinkingly, I just said, yes, of course, of course I'll do that because I get to write a feature. And so I turned up and I knew it was so isolated, I'd need to stay the night. And I had called the roadkill chef, who was a man called Roger, and I'd said, you know, can you recommend any local hotels? And he said, my wife and I actually run our own hotel, so come and stay here. And I unthinkingly and unquestioningly just said, oh yeah, great. When I got there, there was no wife to be seen. <laughs> there was a kind of saucepan of bubbling badger on the stove that smelt <laughs> and tasted like wet dog. You know, that very specific smell that you get. I spent the day with him sort of bombing around these country lanes and scraping up dead animals. And then the evening came, there was still no wife. Darkness fell. Bodmin Moor is quite a creepy place anyway. I'd eaten my badger. The photographer had arrived and left. And I was there on my own with this strange man. And Suddenly I was like, where am I staying the night? And he took me to the end of his garden where there was a converted outbuilding. And that's where I was staying for the night, but it was just me and him. And I suddenly started to feel really quite scared. And I got into that outbuilding, I locked the door and I started getting ready for bed. And then there was a, a knock on the door and this was the roadkill chef, Roger, just suddenly appearing like an apparition. And I realized... I'm totally at his mercy. What? How on earth have I got myself here? And actually, he was just dropping off some new roll. But I felt like there was a, a there was a sort of more sinister intent there as well. Anyway, I survived intact. I went back to London. I filed my copy. A few days later, it was Valentine's Day, and I got a Valentine's card from someone who I think was him. <laughs> the reason I included that anecdote in the book was because it stood as a metaphor for where I was in my 20s, which was someone who said yes to everything in the hopes of being taken seriously, of being seen professionally. And I would put myself in dangerous situations where I was so worried about causing offence to other people that actually I forgot about my own safety and my own integrity. And this was just a perfect example of that. Not only had I eaten badger, which by the way, I never want to do again, but I'd actually put myself in what could have been a dangerous situation. And it was a real wake up call for me to stop living my life according to other people's perceptions or desires of me. It was to start living life as myself as someone with integrity who trusted her own instincts. And that definitely feels like a, a turning point, the beginning of a journey to find your voice and to work out who you are. And I think I really resonated with that, particularly because I felt like my 20s were a total chaotic mess in a way, but obviously have, have led me here and led you to where you are. But in that same um, chapter in the book, you then transition to talk about a character from one of your other novels called Howard. Mm -hmm. And can you talk about how, even if at work you were saying yes to badger assignments, <laughs> that secretly you were writing about other far more empowered characters and then how mm. potentially things started to merge I love that you bring up Howard Pink, who was the, one of the four protagonists in my third novel, Paradise City. And he was this bombastic millionaire who had made his fortune in clothing. And he was based on a number of men I'd interviewed who occupied that kind of role. And they never seemed to question who they were or their right to trample around the world as if they owned it. And I had an enormous amount of fun writing Howard Pink, who had that privilege of entitlement and also the privilege of extreme wealth. It's immensely fun to write about rich people when you're not one yourself. So it coincided with a time at work where I was now working for a different Sunday newspaper, but I was still hidebound by the same limited viewpoint in that 
I thought the way to advance at work was to say yes to absolutely everything. Say yes to overtime, say yes to all the jobs that other feature writers didn't want to do in the hopes that eventually I would be rewarded. And I had a horror of putting people out or um, of asking anything of anyone, of expressing any of my own needs. So my emails in a professional context would be littered with all of these mitigating words that I think a lot of women and marginalized people can relate to. That idea of sending something which is almost undermining your own thinking before you start writing. It was all like, I'm just wondering if you had a moment to look at my idea. It's probably rubbish. I'm so sorry for bothering you. (laughs) You're so busy. Anyway, forget I said anything. It would be an email like that, which was not doing me any favors because I was already chipping away at the integrity of my own ideas. So while I was doing that, I realized I was also capable of writing Howard Pink. And I thought, well, isn't that interesting? Because Howard Pink and his way of thinking and his way of being came so easily to me in a fictional sense that I must have that within me. I must have that capacity to be able to think like that. And it started a a period of my life, which I refer to as the Be More Howard years, where every time I saw myself about to put a mitigating word in an email, I would say to myself, be more Howard. How would Howard write this email? Now, he would write an email that was so far the other end of the extreme that would be littered with swear words and all sorts. I didn't want to be Howard, but just 5% of his ego and his arrogance and his entitlement made me feel so much more empowered. And it was such a good lesson in sprinkling that over my day-to-day existence. I'm trying to incorporate that into my own life. From what everything I hear from listening to How to Fail, I feel like this last two and a half years of the pandemic has been an incredibly empowering one for you. I'll just share that I feel like the parts about identity in your book that you struggled with in your 20s and that finding that voice and that sense of self. I think I had thought I'd found that. And then Mm. this period of isolation almost set me back again. Um, Having been kind of isolated from professional colleagues, being in a great relationship with a very charismatic, big personality. And I think it was very helpful to revisit your book and see the words in print to recognize little parts of myself that I had let slip. So that's that was just something that just, just come up again, which was so helpful and almost going, Angie, be careful, be careful. What do you do to get back to yourself? So my question is, I want to know, you know, about everything about your last few years, and we'll we'll get to Magpie, but also Maybe share a few strategies, like when you Mm. feel like you're a little, you know, left of center of Elizabeth Day, what are those things you do to go, here I am, here I am? That is such a profound and great question because it's something that I genuinely have been looking at for myself over the past few weeks. And I think for me, I've realized that we live in an age which promotes greater diversity, and that's exactly as it should be. How lucky are we to live in this age of reckoning? But I think we're lagging behind in terms of how we view success, and I think there needs to be greater success diversity, greater diversity in the metrics that we use to assess achievement. So when I feel a bit misaligned with myself, it's generally because I've been caught up in the curse of comparison. And I look at peers who seem on paper to be doing better than me in some way, which can be a completely arbitrary way. Or they can appear to be happier on Instagram, which we all know is a two-dimensional way in which we can compare our neurotic insides with everyone else's seemingly perfect outsides. And I know all of this logically. I know that it doesn't actually ring true for me, but I think we live in an age where we can get caught up in it, especially when we are isolated. When we went through the pandemic, for many of us, 
the internet and social media, that was our way of keeping in touch with other people. And, and that can be quite dangerous when you're not feeling fully rooted in yourself. So that's a very long-winded way of saying the way that I try to get back to myself is to remind myself of my own metric of success, which is authenticity and integrity in everything that I do and every part of me. So every part of me, whether professional or personal, I think I strive for that to be the same person. I strive not to put on masks and not to try and be something that I believe other people might want me to be or that I believe I quote unquote should be. I need to really tune back into my instinct and my integrity and being able to do that, whether it's the podcast, in my writing, I gave a speech yesterday, like in my personal relationship, all of those things have to have a congruence to them. That's my metric of success. And the other metric that I have for success is connection. If I have put something out into the world that connects with another person in a meaningful way. I truly believe that's the purpose of my existence. And that is enough. And so it's not actually about how many copies of such and such book I sell. It's not about whether a reviewer liked me. It's not about if someone subscribed to my podcast or not. It's about those moments of individual connection that often happen behind the scenes, but that bring meaning to my life because I'm not great at meditating, but I have recently discovered flotation tanks, which are amazing. <laughs> There's a branch of a flotation tank place that's opened up around the corner from me. And sometimes I just go and float for an hour in pitch black. It's incredible. And more practically, I find exercise really helpful because I spend so much time in my own head that it's really helpful for me to get back into my body, almost to remember I have a body. So whether that's yoga or going for a walk or I love spin classes, stuff like that, that's really helpful for me. And I am also very aware of the power of rest. So I am quite militant about protecting my weekend and ha genuinely having days off where I can sleep and I can watch the Real Housewives or something that doesn't require an enormous amount of brain power and I can eat nourishing food and I can drink enough water. Like I know that rest is really good for me. So those are the ways that I try and bring myself back to me. This episode is brought to you by delicious bear snacks. Between cryotherapy, goat yoga and smoothies made with things you can't even pronounce, wellness can feel a bit complicated. But there's a simpler way to wellness. Bear Snacks. They're a tasty, crunchy snack made simply of apples. With Bear Snacks, less is more. Buy Bear Snacks now at most grocery retailers nationwide. I mean, I'm calling you from New York, another, you know, busy city and the world's coming back. And I've trying to do the similar thing, whereas the week is very vibrant and social and then the weekend is time to be outdoors or, you know, just being with that person you love and yeah. wandering around, not, not having obligations or plans and allowing space for ideas to come. Talking about space to have ideas, what was the timing like in terms of when you started How to Fail and when you kind of had this epiphany of sharing, I think, are my failures and being honest about them is a is kind of a breakthrough moment of authenticity yeah. for myself and writing a, a book that is tethered to one of these in quote failures which is about motherhood and fertility and the the longing for motherhood what was the timing of that and when did you feel wow you know, like Howard was coming to you from some subconscious place, kind of about the future you you potentially wanted more of. When did that wisp of magpie and these characters start forming, you know, in your subconscious? That is such a beautifully expressed question that I, I want to make it my ringtone. <laughs> I think you're absolutely right that it was intertwined with how to fail, so if I go right back to why How to Fail started, it started from a sense that my life had not panned out the way that I expected it to. And then I started questioning the expectation. Where did that come from? How had I inherited it? And for me, 
I was raised in the 80s and fed a diet of heteronormative rom-coms and I had a really conventional notion of how my life would be. I would get married and have children and pursue a career and these things would all be in place in my 30s and it didn't turn out like that and in my 30s I got married to the wrong person, I got divorced, I had two rounds of unsuccessful IVF, the first of three miscarriages I realized that having babies was not going to be straightforward for me. And after my divorce, whilst my life imploded on one hand, the great benefit of an implosion is that it leaves you with a completely blank canvas. And that can be really scary, but it's also a place into which you are forced to examine the life you actually want for yourself. And how to fail came about as a result of that period of my life. Because I realized that as scary as it had been, every single time I had failed, and I put that in quotes, I had also survived it and I'd learned so much from it. And I wanted to have conversations with other people about what they had learned and how they had done it. And I was tiring of the kind of conventional Sunday newspaper interview format, which was all about promoting success. When I launched the podcast in July 2018, I didn't know how much of myself I would share. But it turned out that the conversations, as you know from doing this wonderful podcast, conversations in podcasting can be really intimate in such a gorgeous way. And I did open up and I started speaking about the stuff I'd been through, divorce, fertility, miscarriage. And so many people responded to that. And it was a really beautiful gift for me because I had felt misplaced shame over those things. And there's still a great deal of wrongful stigma attached to it, which means that many people don't want to speak out. But suddenly all of these women and some men were getting in touch with me saying, thank you. And this happened to us. And it means so much that you're talking about it. And so I became really aware that that was something I wanted to continue doing and that that is a purpose that I have. Coming to Magpie, this book of yours, that we have to be very careful the way we talk about it because there are so many plot twists. And of course, you know, as I was halfway through it, I thought, oh, I know, I know what this is. And then, of course, we're walloped with a a, a (laughs) curveball. So when it came to writing my next novel, I subconsciously, I think, knew that I had to write about the thing that was obsessing me or that was in my life right then. And it was still this yearning quest for motherhood in all of its myriad forms. I wanted to put that into a novel because I had never read the reality of the fertility experience as I experienced it in fiction. And novels are how I make sense of the world. And I really wanted for that book to exist. And so I started thinking about how to do it. And unless you've been through fertility issues yourself, it can seem quite an uncomfortable topic. And so I wanted to make it a book that was appealing and accessible in ways beyond that. And one of the most appealing things for me as a reader is a plot twist. And so I actually started with the plot twist, the major plot twist that happens in Magpie, which I will be very careful not to spoil for anyone listening. And the characters came as a result of knowing the plot twist, which is very rare for me. I normally start with characters. And the character of Marissa came to me first, again, because she was a representation of some of the things that I was going through in my late 30s. Marissa was younger than that when she appeared to me, but she had also gone through dispiriting online dates to try and find the quote unquote one. Marissa was someone who had had a troubled childhood and who therefore wanted to curate a perfect life for herself. It's no coincidence that as a job, she paints modern day fairy tales for children and her business is called Telling Tales. Marissa paints her own life. She tells herself the story of her own life and she tells us the story of her own life, but we're not quite sure how much to trust her. And I just really liked the idea of this complicated woman who ultimately you root for. And Magpie opens with her meeting a man called Jake who seems to fulfill every one of her desires. He's really stable. They move in together quite quickly and they start trying for a family together quite quickly. But it's not straightforward and Jake's job isn't going that well. And so they're forced to take in a lodger called Kate. And Kate seems to take an obsessive and rather sinister interest in Marissa's personal life. 
and Marissa becomes equally obsessed with her. And as you as you alluded to, they're both very strong women, but they're very different from each other. So Kate and Marissa are physically different. Marissa is blonde and curvy. Kate is brunette and gamine. And they each have something that the other one doesn't that they really are quite jealous of in the other. And I wanted to use that as a way of looking at how women are often pitted against each other, particularly in the thriller genre, and mm. how actually there is more power to be had when we ally our forces. There was a line, and I think it's it comes from Marissa's point of view early on in the book, which I thought, well, it really resonated, and I thought, oh, I have to try and rid that from my own kind of narrative. And it was that, you know, in having a family or trying to create a family, we are er not erasing the past, but we are improving upon, you know, our own version of what our childhoods, childhoods look like. It's okay to want to change and evolve in a family situation. I think we all want to do that. So, you're so right. There is a generosity of impulse when one seeks to rectify the wrongs of one's childhood with one's own children. But what that does sometimes, if taken to its extreme, is that you forget to look at your child as an individual and you see your child going through things that you went through and you assume that they will have the same responses as you do. So I think it's that thing of, it's a beautiful desire and I imagine it can sometimes be quite difficult as a parent to separate yourself as an individual from this being that you've... Yeah, I think it's just complicated as I'm not a mother and like you would love to be one and, and struggling with that process. I'm so sorry. I think, thank you, thank you, you know, your work and ability to speak so honestly, I think connects us all and you give words to things that we can't say ourselves, which is very, very helpful. Thank you. But I, yeah, I think, so it was interesting coming, oh man, oh, here we go. Oh, here we no, go. Don't. <laughs> You're going to make me oh cry. Oh, I thought this so... might happen. <laughs> you know, I, it's, I actually. I feel you. I so, un I so understand. I so understand. And oh. it's something that like. It lies beyond words. As much as I try and put words to it, I, I, it just, it's such a unique and specific feeling of, of pain. And isn't it, sometimes it just wallops you. Like mm. this morning, I said to my boyfriend, I am so lucky I get to speak to a woman I admire so much. And I'm going to, you know, as a treat to myself, walk around the park and listen to that brilliant, your own how to fail with Dolly Alderton, also like the most divine woman on the yeah. planet. So it was like, here I get to have two of them. And I'd listen to that, you know, very moving conversation, you know, years ago when it came out. And I thought, I'll do it again, you know, just to have you in my mind and, you know, to really connect with everything you've been through. And whoa, like it just, you know, and I think we, as women, we're so good at being strong and saying to ourselves, you know, the next thing, and like, I'm so grateful, I'm grateful mm. for this, I'm grateful. And then something undoes you, but it was something that it needed to happen. I'd been like a bottle, you know, what's it called? I'd been bottled up, I think post Mother's Day as well. It's hard it's just it's exhausting. Hard. It's exhausting. And I just want to thank you so deeply for sharing that with me. And just to say that I see you and I stand with you. And whatever meaning comes with this struggle, I believe some of it to be in the service of preparing us to be the most amazing mothers. I like, we will be amazing mothers because of what we've been through to get there. And I firmly believe that. And I know that we will get there. I know that we will. And I, and I know that it sometimes doesn't help to hear that. <laughs> 
And it doesn't help sometimes when people say, well, there are so many different ways to be a parent, but I just know. And you know, some, it, it goes back to what we were saying at the very beginning about trusting instinct, which is something that the patriarchy has tried to persuade us out of it <laughs> for many millennia. And I just refuse. I now refuse. I just feel like instinct above everything. And there is something in us both that is pushing us forwards. And we are walking one of the toughest paths we could possibly walk. And our children will end up being grateful for it. And in the meantime, how incredible that I get to meet a woman like you. And I get to bond like this through this experience. I'm so grateful for that. Me too. And I think your work has connected so many thousands upon thousands of women and given us a way to talk about these things with one another. You know, we yeah. send your podcast to one another and say, you know, go to minute 1704, you know, those kinds of things. And your ability to bring that inside out in others is so beautiful. I saw that you're at the British Museum and involved with an incredible exhibition that feels very grounded in what we're talking about. What is that exhibition and why, you know, were you asked particularly to, to talk and lead people through it? I'm so glad you asked me about that. It's honestly, I, I feel we're so like psychically connected. It's actually <laughs> freaking me out because, because that was an enormously important thing for me for various reasons. So it's an exhibition called Feminine Power and these fantastic female curators at the British Museum have put together a riveting exhibition which looks at how feminine power was interpreted throughout the ages in all different cultures, how sometimes it was misinterpreted, how a woman like Medusa who is seen in popular mythology as this monstrous gorgon with a head of snakes was actually a survivor of sexual assault how women who died in childbirth in the Aztec era were revered as warriors who died in battle, but then they became demonized after their deaths as these harpies who would come back to earth a few days every year and try and steal people's children. It's about this extraordinary duality that is at the heart of interpretation of feminine power throughout history. How women, when they have big complicated emotions, it's almost like society can't cope with it and they need to transmute it into something else, into making them into demons or goddesses, monsters or witches. And at the same time as all this is going on, you know, many of the most extraordinary goddesses in all sorts of religions are women because the force of creation comes from within them. So it's this amazing exhibition. There were five guest collaborators and my section was called Magic and Malice. <laughs> and it was all about witches and that Aztec demon that I mentioned, who was also a goddess. Medusa was in there, Circe, this witch. And I was chosen because of how open I've been about my own failure in having children and how that has made me, I believe, to be perceived in a certain way by the society that we live in. And it, it was such a riveting journey of exploration for myself. And last night was the opening and I was asked to give a speech to mark the opening of the exhibition. And I decided to write about what was on my heart. <laughs> and it's almost the first time I've done a speech like that where I just wrote what I wanted to say in about 20 minutes, and then I said it. And it was all about female anger and how that's been misinterpreted and unfairly maligned and marginalised. And for many women, myself included, we have been brought up to believe that our anger is unpalatable. So we reach for more palatable emotions like sadness. Like everyone can cope with a sad woman. Hardly anyone can cope with an angry woman. And so it was about that kind of act of reclamation. And I gave the speech and honestly, it was the British Museum. There were people whooping, like women in the audience whooping and applauding yes. throughout. And at the end, I stood down and I was like, I didn't do any of the stuff that I would normally have done in that situation, like making a disarming joke, trying to win people over. I just said what I wanted to say and it felt so good and I felt so aligned with myself. And I stepped off the podium and a surge of women came to me and said, that was so powerful. I've never related to anything so much. I'm angry too. It was amazing. And so that's the exhibition. <laughs> and it feels like a real sea change 
for me personally, because I realize now how I'm, I'm, I'm not alone. Like I'm part of this extraordinary history of powerful women and how it serves us to claim that power rather than to let other people judge us or interpret us for it. I have to come to London and see the exhibition. <laughs> you do it go so with you. good. Yes, I will show you around. <laughs> oh, it sounds like just what we all need, but also to have that recast. And I think there is that complication, isn't there, in in the mother, the sexual woman. I mean, think about it. A woman has so many parts to her life, her physicality, her being. Men yes. don't really evolve so in any physical form, really. I mean, they can think with their heads and what else? I mean, no, like that's think- an amazing point. We shapeshift in our own bodies. Like menstruation, adolescence, like pregnancy or, or not pregnancy, what we go through for that. Menopause, the fact that that shifts again. Like our, our sexuality being seen as something that then blooms and disappears. Like you're so right. There are so many different life phases and what that means as opposed to what we've been told it means. Because men and lots of people have been scared of female power, have been scared of our power of reinvention and creation and evolution. And that's why they've tried to malign it. But actually, we need to step into it. Well, it makes me think of Louise Bourgeois' work as well. There's that photo where she's cradling the huge penis that she's sculpted. (laughs) And I don't know if it's meant to symbolize her son or her, you know, lover or something, but the way she's always recasting any expectation that we have about gender and Mm. roles. It's, and I feel that thankfully institutions are shining that light on women like this and, you know, far more diverse people to tell their stories. And think of, um, I still find the process of being in a relationship is one of discovering that, that childhood just rediscovering that child who had to go through things that were difficult because it comes yes. up, it rears itself. And I know you've spoken so openly about therapy and how much that can help us, you know, even at in our forties, you're like, really? Am I, I still am I still nurturing that little Are girl? Are you in your forties? Yes, yes. Oh I'm forty one. Stop, I'm, this is just heaven. I mean, you, you have amazing skin. What podcast <laughs> listeners can't see is the glow of Angela's skin. But yet, oh gosh, I know. But my 40s have been really empowering and really exhausting because it has been full-on continuous self-discovery and ex- excavation of all of that. I'm looking at the time and I have to let you go, which is, you know, so, so difficult. But I want to ask Elizabeth Day, what lights you up? Well, definitely my friendships. In fact, my next book is all about friendship. It's a nonfiction book. And it's been such a lovely thing to write because it's been a real exploration of my friends and also how I feel about it. And I know the pandemic has been a time of great reassessment for everyone in terms of their relationships. So my friends... My cat <laughs> genuinely lights me up. My, yeah, my my husband, reading, long baths, but more on a more profound philosophical level, feeling a sense of connection, a sense of meaning, and a sense of being understood. Those are really key principles for me. And everything I do, I think, stems from that that need for connection and the need to offer other people understanding and in so doing be understood myself. And I felt that so deeply during the course of this conversation, Angela, it has been an absolute delight and privilege. And I feel like you and I are connected in some very, very like profound way. It's been just a pleasure to talk to you. And we didn't dive into the novel so much, but it is something that has to be contained 
for the for the thrill and the enjoyment of the read. And I loved it and obviously connected to it for so many reasons, particularly because these women are complicated and and important to understand. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for the generosity and wisdom of your questions. It's been complete pleasure. Lit Up is a podcast from Sugar23. It's hosted by me, Angela Ledgerwood, and produced by Liam Billingham. Olivia Olmer is the marketing and editorial consultant. Mike Mayer and Michael Sugar are executive producers. Andre Rodofsky wrote the theme music. See you in two weeks. Hold up. 